Okay, here's a quick video explaining how you can potentially revive a dead uh, GBX45 or one of the other NOCO GBX series booster batteries. Apparently they have a tendency for the internal battery to go not all the way dead, but it'll get to a low enough voltage that it will no longer accept a charge. So the starting condition here is that you press one of the buttons on top and you get no lights, no indication that it's turning on. If you have the ability to measure uh, voltage from a USB source, you can plug in a USB-C cable. You'll find that there's five volts on the line, but no current actually flowing into the battery. So that's how this one behaved. And in, in other cases, that probably is an indicator that the same thing happened. The battery inside got too low, and so uh, it won't take a charge. So what I did is I first had to find where the screws are. There's uh, six screws uh, from the bottom. They're the triangle head style uh, security screws. Um, to find these screws, first I had to take off these, uh, these rubber pads that are on the bottom. Uh, if I did it again, I could do a lot better job. But the uh, key is to use some heat. And I used one of these little, uh, I think it's called a spudger, one of these little like plastic uh, tools, pry tools that comes with like um, repair kits for, for small electronics, you know, phone battery or phone phone screen repair kits, these work really well. So I have a hot air uh, nozzle here. Um, you don't have to use this. A, uh, a heat gun or a, or a blow dryer would probably work just as well. But the idea is just to pick underneath it and uh, start peeling it back and aim the heat right at the place where that rubber is peeling back. If you aim the heat right here, imagine this is peeling back. Um, you, can, you don't have to use this anymore. You can just pull it and just put a little tension on the rubber pull really, really, really slowly. It'll, it'll actually kind of unpeel itself. And if you give it enough heat, the adhesive will come up with it um, as well. And you can see here, I pulled too fast and it left some adhesive residue. So moving beyond the uh, rubber pads, that, that gives us access to the, uh, the six screws that are here. They are that triangle uh, security screw. I don't have any of those triangle uh, screwdrivers. I've been meaning to get some, but it turns out uh, you can also use a Torx bit. Uh, keep in mind, you may slightly damage that Torx bit, um, but if you're okay with that, uh, that's a workaround. So in this case, it took a T7, a T7 Torx bit. will fit into the head of these triangle screws. And uh, it's actually a very good fit, but to go with that one next level, I, uh, I pushed it in there. Uh, find something you can lightly tap on top of the bit with just to really seat it all the way down into the screw and then you just turn it out like a regular screwdriver. Uh, just put some force down on it and uh, you can pull these screws out with a Torx bit. So once I found that, um, the next step was, you know, slowly and carefully finding out if this actually was free. And I determined that it was free all the way around. However, I think due to the adhesive that's applied to the battery inside this, it doesn't easily come all the way open. You can see you can kind of open it a little ways this way, or you can open it a little ways the other way. In any case, you don't need it to open up all the way. What you need to do is just open it far enough to find access to the, uh, the battery inside. And you can do that, well, it's gonna be tough to see because um, it's just, just gonna be tough to put on camera. But basically I can tell you what's inside here is that the, the positive cable runs from inside the battery or from the battery terminal directly to the external um, port here or the external terminal. So positive is direct to the battery, and the negative side actually runs through the battery management system, and that's really common for BMSs with these lithium batteries. So here's the junction, oops. Here is where we have two negative cables. And I'm gonna to try to get this in frame as best I can. You know what, let me do this. Okay, so here's the two negative cables. One, the one you can see right now, actually just runs to the external terminal. But this other one, on the back of this PCB, right above my thumb there, this rear one goes directly to the battery. So using care, uh, you want to pay attention, you know, to make sure you're not touching anything inadvertently. But with a, um, I have a kind of a makeshift, a homemade DIY bench power supply here. Um, I just set it up uh, with my alligator clip leads, and I put the negative lead onto this board and just grabbed the end of that negative lead where it soldered onto the board. So that's where you grab the negative lead. And then the positive, since it flows right out the connector 
to the outside, you can disconnect the uh, positive to, let's make sure the power supply is off. Yep, it is. Uh, it's this variable part up here that's off. I disconnected the uh, positive to this external port. And you can see here, I've actually already um, been applying charge to this battery. And so my, uh, my little power supply here is showing that it's, it's showing 11.92 volts here. When I initially connected it, this showed down in the range of like three volts. Voiceover because I need to make a correction. At this point where I was filming, I was under the impression that this was a 3S LiPo pack or three lithium polymer cells in series for a nominal voltage of 12 volts. It turns out that it's actually a 4S pack. In fact, when I was all done with this, I measured the output and fully charged it put out 16.3 volts. That seems like it may be too high for a vehicle, but it's really not. Vehicles can handle voltage quite a lot higher than that, and it actually makes a lot of sense due to the voltage drop that happens whenever you're cranking the starter. So I had been targeting nine volts using my power supply, thinking I wanted to hit a target of three volts per cell. And actually I was charging four cells in series. So that nine volts turned out to be uh, 2.25 volts per cell which actually turned out to be enough. I thought I needed to go all the way up to three, I didn't. So that actually worked out well. I, like I say in the video, I was preferring to charge as little as possible with the bench power supply and get it over to USB as quickly as possible. So nine volts for uh, 4S is apparently sufficient. And I set it to uh, initially 50 milliamps and then later 100 milliamps. I was in no hurry to charge this up. But to describe what happened, it's pretty simple. You know, it started out just over three volts for the whole pack and current started flowing up to my current limit until the voltage got to my set, my set limit of 9.1 volts. And at that point, the current uh, went from its limit down. And that's when I was um, confident that I had charged the battery to, to that level. So with 9.1 volts for the whole battery, I uh, turned off the power, disconnected my leads, and you know, my goal is to basically get it onto its own USB charger as quickly as possible. Um, I didn't feel a need to keep on charging it through my bench power supply, although I'm, I'm sure I could have. Going through the USB charger like, you're, like it's designed for, that means you have the benefit of all those safety mechanisms that are built into the, uh, to the battery management system. So with that done, I'll give me a moment just to kind of get this back together. There we go. So uh, at that point I still, um, needed to charge it, but I was able to press this button and I got lights. So I knew that was good news. Um, I was only getting like, you know, one, and I still am only getting one uh, red light at the bottom of the gauge there. But with that done, now I could go ahead and plug it into a USB charger and I'll show you what that looked like next. Cause I didn't just go ahead and plug it into any charger. I wanted to see if power was really flowing. So for the USB-C charging portion of things, uh, I started out with just a small wall charger with a USB-A to USB-C cable. I wanted again to uh, limit the current and to see how it did. So um, just go ahead and use my inline meter here that shows the, uh, the voltage and, and current that's going through it. Plug in the cable. And you can see that it lit up, it's charging. My inline meter shows that it's five volts, but only 0.67 amps only about 3.4 watts. So this battery at this point is somewhere, I don't know, 11 and a half volts or something. So it's in that range where it's definitely not full, but it's, it's well above the uh, minimum voltage cutoff. So it's charging at 3.4 watts. At this point, um, I'm happy to switch to a faster charger. And so I'm using, in this case, an Apple laptop charger that is capable of 20 volt uh, USB-C power delivery. So we'll plug that in and see what it negotiates. And for reasons like we won't get into here, sometimes you have to flip the connector on this meter because of some capabilities it has. So there you go. So it's already negotiated a 20 volt charging level and that's a USB power delivery standard voltage, but only four watts. So I'm guessing that the, um, the circuitry inside the NOCO boost is probably still limiting the charge current. And, uh, and that may just because it's at a low state of charge. Uh, you can see it's still just one bar there. So as it gets further and further along in the charging, I'm reasonably certain that it'll, it will allow more current to flow. But this, uh, cause this charger is a USB-C charger 
and I think it's like 140 watts capable or something like that. And so uh, that's not a limitation. Uh, I'm almost certain that it's the Noco Boost limiting itself. So at this point, I feel safe to walk away. We're back in uh, the, the normal um, situation where you're charging through the circuitry that's inside there that's designed to protect the battery. Earlier on, when you're charging the battery directly, I, I definitely recommend staying nearby. These LiPo batteries can be brought back from low or zero voltage. If you charge slowly and you monitor them, they're not nearly as dangerous as a lot of people make them out to be, but there is risk involved. So I just recommend uh, charging slow current, checking it to feel it, make sure there's not a lot of heat building up and uh, stay nearby. So anyways, that's how you can bring back these NOCO Boost batteries if you've had one that's uh, gone completely dark on you. It's about 15 minutes later and I came to check the charge progress and I can see that now the second gauge light is lit up and my inline meter is showing that we're still on 20 volts from the Apple uh, laptop USB-C charger, but the current has gone way up now to 2.6 amps for 53 watts of charging. And that's up from three and a half or four watts that we started with. So the NOCO Boost is definitely limiting the current at the starting phases of a charge. And then somewhere along the way, maybe at the same time that the second light starts turning on, it ups the current and uh, goes to a much faster charge. 53 watts will charge us up quite a bit faster than a four watt charge. So I just wanted to show what's going on there. I hope this was helpful to anyone that has this boost pack and has the same uh, issues that I was having and is uh, attempting to revive it, keep it out of the landfill. Thanks for watching. And if you're inclined, hit that like button.